today we have uh, Bruce Ellingwood, uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering from Colorado State, uh, talking about civil infrastructure and uh, climate change, uh, how to manage risk. Uh, and uh, it's a quite a big project, it seems, uh, and uh, I'm really excited. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us today. Uh, so Dr. Ellingwood's career, uh, five decades, has included service in federal agencies and leading academic institutions. Uh, his teaching, research, and professional interests center on the application of methods of probability and statistics to structural engineering and risk-informed decision-making. He is internationally recognized as a leading authority on structural load modeling, reliability and risk analysis of engineered facilities, and the technical development of probability-based codified standards for design of structures. Ellingwood is the author of nearly 500 technical publications, former editor of Structural Safety and leading international journal in that field, and serves on several other editorial boards. Uh, he has held numerous leadership positions in professional organizations, including the American Society of Civil, Civil Engineers, American Institute of Steel Construction, and the International Association for Structural Safety and Reliability and has received numerous awards from those organizations. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a distinguished member of ASCE. Uh, the talk will be followed by a Q&A session. So uh, after Bruce is talking for around 45 minutes or so, uh, and the presentation is over, I'm gonna be uh, reading uh, your questions uh, that you can post to us uh, using the Q&A button. So please feel free as, as Bruce talks uh, to write up your questions and I'm gonna be follow up, uh, following uh, his conversation with those questions. And then we end at six o'clock. So uh, thanks very much. And Bruce, now is your turn. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Boaz. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and. Uh, when I was invited uh, by Professor uh, David uh, Casagrande, uh, who's the director of the Lehigh uh, Environmental Initiative, uh, to come, I, I was I, I was I was very uh, very happy. Uh, but he said it's a very broad audience. He said it's a, uh, he said this is a general audience, and so uh, I, I prepared my my talk accordingly, and 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 I hope that there's. A little something for all uh, of, of, of you listeners, both those of you who are in, in engineering and in particular structural engineering, and, and those of you who perhaps are in other fields, because of course climate change uh, is a uh, is is something that affects us all uh, and uh, will continue uh, to affect us all in the foreseeable future. And uh, uh, I've been involved with a, uh, an activity within the American Society of Civil Engineers. You know, to look at what the impact of climate change uh, might be on uh, on civil infrastructure systems, uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, today uh, uh, with you, uh, and 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 hopefully uh, all of you will find something that you can take away uh, from from this presentation. So, uh, uh, in in the way of background, I, I'm a structural engineer by training. Uh, I'm I'm a probabilistic risk analyst by avocation, uh, and uh, you know what structural engineers do uh, is they provide um, they provide uh, uh, our civil infrastructure um, uh, that's necessary to maintain you know social welfare and public uh, public safety uh, and uh, economic viability of communities, and that includes buildings and transportation systems, um, uh, telecommunication facilities. Uh, power generation, uh, water and wastewater systems, flood protection systems, and all of those systems <clears throat> need to be designed in some way uh, for, uh, for uh, um, not, not only uh, service requirements, but also for natural hazards, uh, including uh, uh, synoptic winds and tropical cyclones, uh, storm surge, coastal flooding, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of these hazards that I have listed here in black uh, are uh, are, are contained in our building codes. Uh, 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 those in, in blue are, are problematic from a climate uh, point of view, but they're not typically dealt with uh, in building codes and standards. They're dealt with more 
uh, in terms of, of land use requirements and zoning uh, regulations. And everything on the list here that I've, uh, that I've indicated with the exception of earthquakes and tsunamis and tornadoes and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the jury is still out on tornadoes, uh, but I won't talk about those today, is gonna be affected by climate change uh, in, in, in some way. So uh, uh, the effect of climate change will have a significant impact on the practice of uh, civil and structural engineering. Uh, as structural engineers, uh, our design objectives are you know, first and foremost in our regulatory system are for strength and stability. Uh, uh, also serviceability, functionality, uh, durability, uh, economy uh, and maintainability. Uh, these are all things that we are concerned about in some in, in various levels, but safety uh, is the most important one because uh, that's, uh, that, that's what governs uh, our building codes. Uh, and, and, and that is where the practice of structural engineering is most likely you know, to meet uh, the climate change issue, at least in the short term. Uh, so th this is what we deal with now, uh, just to lay a little bit of background uh, to, uh, to, to what the problem is. You know, losses due to hurricanes uh, are, are increasing. Um, uh, I've just listed a few here. Many of the names will be familiar to you. Certainly Hurricane Sandy uh, hit fairly close to home for, for all of you. Uh, I'd like to point out a couple of things. And, and, and first of all, uh, is that US uh, economic activity is overwhelmingly concentrated uh, al along coastal areas and Great Lakes coasts. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that, um, to the extent that uh, climate change affects uh, these, uh, it's, it's going to affect uh, structural design practice. The other uh, point is that rapid population growth and economic development have concentrated probably in the past 20 or 25 years in coastal areas. Just as an example, South Florida is projected to have more than 15 million residents by you know, in, a, in, a, in, another, uh, in another 30 years. Uh, and so um, you know, that means that exposure to natural hazards uh, is, is going to increase in areas uh, where climate change also uh, drives the bus in terms of, of natural hazard uh, intensities. Uh, coastal flooding uh, uh, is, is a serious problem. Uh, this, was, uh, this was from Hurricane Katrina. Um, uh, riverine flooding, uh, I, I hesitate to say that it's a nuisance hazard uh, because it's not, particularly for the people who are involved. Uh, riverine flooding uh, doesn't uh, result in the enormous losses that hurricanes and, and earthquakes and, 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 uh, and storm surge do, but uh, every single state in the Union uh, has, been, has had a disaster uh, declaration uh, in, the, in the past 30 years, and the National Flood Insurance Program has paid out nearly $50 billion in claims uh, since 1978. So riverine flooding as a result of snow melt and excessive precipitation uh, is a significant problem. Uh, and, and it's a continuing problem. Landslides, uh, 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 the susceptibility to landslides driven by increases in precipitation uh, uh, that have occurred in, in the past several decades. Uh, the wild and urban interface fire uh, is one that probably many of you are familiar with. I show this picture right here from, from Alberta, Canada uh, to give some scope of the problem. About 550,000 acres were affected by it. This is the single largest natural disaster uh, that's occurred uh, in Canada, uh, uh, it, it, at least uh, while their insurance industry has been keeping records of, of the costs of disasters. And then, of course, many of you will remember uh, uh, four years ago, uh, the uh, camp fire in California that basically wiped out uh, the small community of Paradise, along with several other small communities. This was due to, uh, uh, to, an, electrical, uh, to an electrical fault. Uh, and uh, 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 PG&E declared bankruptcy uh, as a result of the claims that came in from, uh, from, from this. And so uh, 85 fatality, $16.7 billion in damage, uh, and uh, increasing risk uh, due to these types of events, not only due to population growth and economic development, but combined with prolonged drought uh, as, as well, which has affected the Western part of the United States. And so you know, the losses due to natural hazards uh, are continuing to increase uh, and uh, uh, over, the past, uh, over, over the past 50 years, both insured and uninsured losses. Uh, and in an era of climate change, these losses are going to accelerate uh, if we don't do something to, to address them. 
uh, by improved civil engineering practices as well as improved uh, planning uh, and 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 uh, design uh, for extremes of natural hazards. And so this is a, a, a kind of a background uh, to you know why this is so important uh, and and what we can expect to see happening in in the foreseeable future if we don't do something about the uh, and address the problem. Uh, climate change uh, is is is. Uh, is is a is a significant problem. Uh, it affects uh, public health. It affects agriculture. It affects agriculture in particularly uh, in, in 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 low income or poor countries. Uh, it impacts the forest, water, our water resources. It has impact on social uh, social uh, 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 coastal areas uh, and and natural land use. And so it's a very very broad. A very very broad uh, problem, and and it's interesting uh, that Boaz in his in his introduction mentioned that this was a this was a theme uh, during your your presentations this year uh, at the Friends of the Library uh, because it's a very very broad problem, and it's going to take the best efforts of all of us to address it. So uh, I'll use that as an introduction to the special project that I'm involved with that's sponsored by ASC, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and its Structural Engineering Institute. Uh, and it's uh, the problem, it, it, it's, a, it's a special project that in, in, in broad terms deals with the performance of civil infrastructure in a changing climate. Uh, because the climate change, uh, as we'll see, increases the climatic loads that we've designed for. It increases the occurrence of extreme events. It, it can accelerate the aging and structural deterioration of our infrastructure, and there's a potential for catast catastrophic impact on structural safety over uh, a facility lifetime, which may be anywhere from 25 to 100 years, depending on the facility. So you know, there's a clear need uh, for this, and the American Society of Civil Engineers as a professional organization is in a unique position to provide the expertise for addressing this particular problem as it applies to civil infrastructure. So there are three um, working groups uh, in this special project. Uh, one is on climate projection models and data, and this is a, a project that involves primarily climate scientists. You know, there's a project uh, that I'm co-chairing along with uh, Professor Paulo Bacchini at uh, Lehigh University on the impact of climate on infrastructure performance. And then finally, you know, there's a third working group that deals with life cycle risk-based decision-making. And this is also co-chaired uh, by uh, Professor Dan Frangipal, who is a professor uh, at uh, Lehigh University as well. So Lehigh has a, has a big stake in, in, in this project that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on working group two because that's the one that I'm uh, involved with. But uh, I want you to understand that there's a lot of things going on in the background. So a few observations, you know, just uh, a few takeaways. The, the global warming uh, due to climate change uh, has accelerated over the past 50 years. Uh, uh, most climate scientists and, and most engineers believe that it is primarily due to human activity, uh, but the fact is that it's, ch it's changing. Uh, the U.S. average temperature has increased over one degree centigrade since 1900. Most of that increase has occurred since about 1970. And the most recent decade was the nation's warmest on record, and by 2100, the year 2100, we can see expect to see a further rise of anywhere from two and a half to four degrees centigrade or more in terms of average temperature. You know, the average uh, intensity, frequency, and duration of North Atlantic hurricanes, uh, as well as the frequencies of the strongest hurricanes, have all increased since the early 1980s and are likely to produce higher risks for the U.S. in the U.S. for the, both the East and the Gulf Coast. Uh, global sea level uh, is projected to rise another 0.4 to 0.9 meters uh, by uh, 2100, uh, and uh, parts of the United States and the southeast, like southern Florida, are, are in, in danger of being inundated uh, as a result of, of sea level rise. The hot extremes, including heat waves, are becoming more frequent. Uh, cold extremes have become less frequent, uh, and the average precipitation uh, has increased significantly since 1900, uh, and increases in the frequency and the intensity of extreme precipitation events are projected actually for all uh, U.S. Uh, regions. One of the things that makes um, uh, climate change so difficult to deal with uh, from a planning and, uh, perspective, and indeed for, from a civil engineering perspective, 
uh, is that it, it, its effects on the built environment are, are what we call non-stationary. Now that's a that, that, that's a two-bit word just to just to say uh, that that things uh, that the past is not representative of the future. Uh, that uh, in, in in the past uh, we've made the assumption uh, in in much of our our public planning and in fact in our, our building regulations, you know that the past in fact is the representative of the of the future, and that enables us to use statistical methods for forecasting what the what the likely events are and what the likely extreme events are, and the fact uh, that. Uh, that the, the climate effects are non-stationary in, in, in nature and, and that we don't know exactly what the correct non-stationary model or, or, or for climate is, makes it very, very difficult to, to deal with this. You know, uh, uncertainty uh, in, in, in future climate extremes has a number of components. There's background uncertainty, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, due to the natural variability in the climate. I would refer to that as chaotic or aleatory. Uh, you can see that on the previous slide. Uh, that's the, the dark gray band. Uh, 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 showing there from 1970 to 2020. There's uncertainty in the climate model uh, response or the sensitivity of the projection of future emissions uh, uh, due to uh, um, anthropogenic uh, climate forcings. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and the uncertainty in the probabilities you can see increases at the tail. Uh, and so if I if, if I look back at that, you, you can see how the uncertainty over time increases uh, as a result of all of these different uncertainties compounded on the top of the, just the basic fluctuations that one expects to see in, uh, in, 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 in climate. This is the starting point, uh, at least in the climate science community, for determining what those effects might look like. They're referred to as representative concentration pathways, uh, and, uh, and the, the recent uh, in, intergovernmental panel on climate change, which issued its report late, late last year, you know, introduced uh, something called a shared economic uh, pathway to provide fur further context for these numbers. And, and, and to think of this, these different representative uh, uh, concentration pathways basically um, uh, represent our best projections as, as, as to what's going to happen uh, under various conditions of social and economic development and, and political will you know, over over the next uh, over the next eighty years, and and they're identified by a number of different uh, uh, numbers arbitrarily uh, representative concentration pathway two point six all the way up to eight point five uh, for different radiation forcings in terms of watts per square meter uh, of, of of solar energy, as well as emissions uh, in terms of uh, gigatons of of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and so this is not something that we expect engineers uh, to have to work with. This is at the purview of climate scientists, but it's important to realize two things. First of all, that this is the starting point for the analysis you know, that we're going to describe why it's so important to have climate scientists involved uh, in, in the process. And, and the other thing I want you to take away from uh, these, these figures here is the growth of uncertainty that's going to occur and what happens over the next 20 over the next 80 years. And, and this depends on public policy. It depends on, uh, on, on the willingness uh, of, of societies to uh, do what's necessary uh, in order to uh, minimize uh, the increase in greenhouse gases. And you can see that the uncertainties increase substantially uh, as we move out, particularly beyond around the year 2060. So that means in about another, in, in about another 40 years, you know, we, we really don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and there, you cannot assign probabilities to these different representative concentration pathways because they simply represent different scenarios of what might happen uh, if, if certain measures are taken in the public sphere as opposed to measures not taken uh, in the public sphere. So this, this, is, this uncertainty, what I call deep uncertainty, it, uh, has a very, very large knowledge-based or epistemic component to it. Uh, and, and this makes it especially difficult to deal with it. Here is a, a typical uh, example of, of, of what's happening in sea level rise in the North Atlantic. And you can see that, you know, up until the year about, about 1850 or so, things were relatively constant. Then all of a sudden things really started to accelerate uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the 20th century. Uh, and and th there's a significant growth uh, in, in, in the sea level change. Uh, this uh, represents our, our best current projections of sea level rise, and this is based on, on two studies 
uh, that have been done by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which also has responsibility for coastal infrastructure as part of its uh, enabling legislation. Uh, and you can see uh, that uh, the, the, the projected sea level rise in meters uh, by the year 2100 uh, at, on an average basis, you, you know, has a tremendous range. And you can also see that in the latter part of the 21st century, you know, there's going to be a tremendous acceleration in the growth of sea level rise, which I think is one reason why climate scientists are so concerned about, uh, about us reaching a tipping point, because these things, these things are nonlinear. They, they increase uh, in a nonlinear fashion as time uh, goes on. Uh, this uh, is a, is this little slide shows uh, shifts in temperature uh, that result from 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 global warming, uh, and and uh, you know the current uh, the, the the older I would say the current climate uh, where you've described you know the climate uh, the temperature uh, un, under stationary conditions the, the past representative of the future uh, is shown in the blue uh, and you can see what happens in, in in the projected climate. And this is just this is just a, a sketch. Uh, it just shows we're, we're, we're going to get a shift in, in the mean or the median value. We're going to have less cold. We're going to have much more hot weather. Uh, and, and this is something you know, that needs to be taken into account uh, in, 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 in developing uh, projections. So the special project objectives uh, of this are to identify and characterize hazards probabilistically that are susceptible to climate effects, to deal with this issue of non-stationarity in some way uh, that, makes, uh, that makes scientific sense, uh, to uh, identify and assess the impact of changes on climate-related loads, and finally to recommend processes to implement the best climate science in, in structural engineering without disrupting structural engineering practice. Uh, and and, and th this, this is particularly important uh, because, uh, be, because uh, uh, we, we, need to, we, it, we need to build a business case of some kind for taking climate effects into account or else it's, it's, it's quite likely that, that, that the, the construction industry, which basically amounts to about 20% of our gross domestic product in the United States is, is going to be reluctant to, to adopt some of these measures because they think it's going to, <clears throat> it's going to increase the cost of, 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 of building and maintaining the built environment uh, in an area of a significant economic growth and population increase as well. So uh, current structural codes, <clears throat> for those of you who are not structural engineers, focus on life safety. You know, they're prescriptive in nature, which places some natural constraints on what's possible. They've been underpinned by structural reliability theory for about four decades. Uh, and code development in the United States is evolutionary in, 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 in nature, and it's relatively stable. Uh, the, 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 the structural engineering community and the building, uh, the building code community is fairly conservative uh, in terms of adopting changes and so forth. Uh, current performance under stationary conditions, now I emphasize, is believed to balance safety and economically appropriately. So that, that's, that, that's a, a significant constraint. Uh, if, 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 the, the, if, if the climate change uh, results in an increase in 50% in the cost of building construction, you know, there's going to be a problem uh, in doing what's necessary. Uh, many of you may not realize uh, that unlike many countries, the United States has no national building code uh, or no code developing organization. Uh, you know, this is, this is you know, characteristic of, of, of the U.S. and, and it, it has its antecedents in, in, in the way that the U.S. Constitution delegates authority to the states versus to the federal government. I won't go into that. Uh, but the, the fact that ASCE is involved with this uh, uh, is... is uh, is, is, is because the, there is no national authority you know, that has responsibility for developing requirements for public safety or for building construction. So ASCE uh, has to do this, and they do it by the most part through the work of professional committees like the one that, uh, like the one that we're talking about today. So I want to talk a little bit about hydrostatic and, and hydrodynamic loads, wind pressure, snow loads, ice loads on con conductors and, and towers. Uh, roof loads, uh, rain loads on roofs, and temperature effects. Because these are the, these are the loads that appear uh, in the ASCE standard on structural loading ASCE seven that are probably most affected by, you know, by climate change. Uh, and they all have a probabilistic basis. If you go back to, if you go back to the earlier slides and you saw, you remember how the uncertainties increased uh, as we moved out into the twentieth first century. 
uh, this little slide here shows what we historically have done under stationary conditions that the past is representative of the future. Um, uh, uh, one can construct a, uh, a relative frequency uh, of, of what the annual extreme loads are likely to look like. Uh, and one can move out and select the design value uh, uh, based on some small probability of exceedance in a given year. Now, now there's a lot more to it than that, but uh, since this is a, a general talk, I won't go into too much more detail on that, other than just to ask you to keep in mind you know, that we're basic structural safety concepts and structural design, structural load models on the idea you know, that, the, that the probability of exceeding uh, the design load is going to be acceptably small. And, and how is acceptably small determined? Well, it's determined on a historical basis. But if, if you're dealing with a non-stationary demand on the structure, you have no historical basis. Uh, and, and, and other methods have to be em employed in order to come up with appropriate design loads. You know, the International Code Council identifies um, uh, appropriate design loads probabilistically uh, in terms of uh, risk categories of different buildings. And, and I didn't put in numbers here for size of event here because they vary due to, they, they vary from the different uh, climate effects, but very large would be small probability uh, 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 very small would be small probability and, if, and in between is in between. So what this says in effect, uh, if you read across the top line is if you're, de if you're designing a hospital you know, with, um, uh, which, which includes, uh, 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 which would be in risk category four or po other post-disaster facilities such as uh, police stations, fire stations, um, uh, uh, um, uh, retirement communities where, where people have limited mobility, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you design it conservative, very conservative, really. Whereas if you're designing an agricultural building or a temporary storage building, uh, you, you design it uh, at a much lower load, uh, and you're willing you're willing to you're willing to accept uh, um, uh, much higher levels of damage. And so this thought process that goes into the building code development is something you know, that it, it, it's it's had a chance to mature over the past forty years, and it's very very unlikely, it's very very unlikely that this is going to change as we move toward adopting climate change provisions and building codes. It'll be adjusted, but the basic idea is going to be the same. So this is kind of a, this is a constraint. And I just want to give you, since you're, you know, some of you probably are interested in well, what, what sort of impacts are we talking about right now? Um, I'll, I'll give you an, an illustration for hurricane wind pressures. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, without all of the, the, the complicated part of the building code, the wind pressure on a building is designed uh, it's 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 proportional to the square of the wind speed, uh, and and it's also a function of a number of different aerodynamic coefficients, which have something to do with, you know, with, with the shape of the building and its height and the direction of the wind and things of that nature. And so, just keep your keep your eye on on the c sub w v squared and kind of forget about the rest of it. But this is how this is basically how we calculate wind effects on buildings. And, and one of my former uh, uh, PhD students, who I believe is actually listening in today as part of her thesis, looked at the impact of hurricane, non-stationary hurricane um, uh, uh, wind effects on, on, on buildings in Miami. And she started with a, a number of storms over the Atlantic Basin from 1851 to 2012. And this is in a database. It's called the HERDAP database. It's increased. You can see the number of storms has, has, has increased uh, over the last 125, 150 years. Uh, along with that increase due to sea, due to climate, has been an increase in sea surface temperature. And, and uh, sea surface temperature is, is one of, although not the, the, the only, physical impact of climate change. Because a hurricane, uh, from a th thermodynamics point of view, is like a heat engine. It draws it, it draws heat up off of the ocean, and any increase in the in the sea surface temperature is going to cause an intensity, an increase in the intensity of of the storm. Uh, and so uh, she developed a simulation procedure uh, uh, which simulated um, uh, uh, hurricanes in, in in the North Atlantic. She tracked uh, the hurricane uh, tracks this way, and she ends up with a distribution of hurricane wind speeds from Miami, Florida. Now, why Miami? Well, it just happened to be what we were looking at. But uh, you can see uh, what happens, what the difference is in the stationary versus the non-stationary case. Uh, and the increase in the wind load now, remember, is proportional to the square of the wind speed. 
And the most likely or the modal um, uh, wind, wind speed under the stationary case is about 168 miles, and 100 and, um, uh, 150 miles an hour approximately. And the most likely uh, uh, under the, under the uh, climate effect is 168. And so if you square that, you get a ratio of about 1.25. So uh, climate change, uh, if uh, under this particular model, and I emphasize under this particular model, that would re result in approximately a 25% increase uh, in, uh, in wind forces on buildings. Now, uh, it, it can, can we cope with that from an engineering point of view? Yes, absolutely we can. Uh, we have the knowledge to do it. Can we cope with it from an economic point of view? Well, that's where the question gets a little bit uh, hazy uh, because 25% increase uh, in, in, in wind pressure you know, uh, is, is going to have a significant impact on, 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 on the building construction industry. And so these are the types of things that need to be looked at uh, in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of, of impacts of climate uh, on, on, uh, on, on the built environment. We've done similar analyses, of course, for other you know, for other types of loads as well. And the numbers are typically on that same order, you know, anywhere from, from 10 to 20% approximately, you know, uh, uh, using current climate projections. And so that gives you some ideas. To, incidentally, the cost of a, of a building is not linearly proportional to, it's not one-to-one -one proportional to the, uh, to, to, to the loads, because there are other things that go into the cost of a building other than just simply the magnitude of the load. So, but these types of analyses have to be done in order to build a business case for moving climate uh, effects into the building codes. Now, uh, a critique, uh, because uh, you know, it's important to realize the limitations of the data uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, first of all, the climate science data tend to be presented in terms of global averages. You know, we, these are referred to sometimes as global climate models or GCMs. Uh, in order to be useful for civil infrastructure assessment and design, they have to be downscaled because the global climate models cover areas on the order of 100,000 square kilometers. And when you're dealing with in, in individual infrastructure, you, you've got to scale it down to the scale of you know, 10 square kilometers or something on that order. And, and one of the largest sources of uncertainties, and in particular, the sources of those so-called knowledge-based or epistemic uncertainties are the uncertainties that are associated with the downscale, because there are a lot of different models you know, that are used for downscaling. And, and you know, they're physics-based, uh, but it's very, very hard to validate them. So we don't know exactly what models to use. Uh, the statistics of the extremes are, are necessary for structural safety assessment. Uh, and, and finally, um, much of the engineering literature that we work with you now discusses the climate effect of uh, the impact of climate in very general terms. So there are no clear, there's no clear guidance to help engineers assess uh, the effect of increasing hazards on specific structures. Now, the takeaway from that is that further improvements in design and the built environment and performance is going to require uh, some uh, sort of collaboration between the climate science community and the structural engineering community that we haven't had before. Uh, and, and, and that sounds like a fairly easy thing to do, but it's really not so easy because those two professional groups speak an entirely different language uh, and, and, and that we have to facilitate them coming together to come up with solutions uh, to deal with climate change in the built environment so that we can keep the best science uh, in, 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 in our in our design practices and at the same time have something that the structural engineering profession won't feel as disruptive or excessively costly. So these are the, 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 this, this is this is a very, very difficult optimization problem. I'll just put it that way and, and we'll, we'll let it go at that. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about performance-based engineering because performance-based engineering is a new paradigm uh, that in the past 20 odd years or so is kind of sweeping through the uh, through the structural engineering uh, community, it, it eliminates a lot of the prescriptive requirements that currently appear in the building code, and it allows uh, the structural engineer, you know, to 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 use his training and and his best engineering practices and his knowledge to develop a structure that will have predictable performance, uh, rather than one that simply defines uh, that conforms to the requirements of the building code. Uh, and it requires uh, a team effort. It requires the engineer, the architect, uh, and, 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 the, and the developer and the building owner to agree on specific goals for safety and functionality. 
It usually involves a probabilistic evaluation of hazards, and we've already talked about that at some length, and then of an evaluation of design alternatives against performance objectives, but it does not prescribe a specific uh, technical solution. Now, performance-based engineering has really gotten traction uh, in the earthquake community, uh, and so we do have some experience with it, and it's very likely uh, that some of the innovations in, in, in climate-resistant building construction are going to be implemented uh, in the performance context rather than in the traditional prescriptive code context, because it gives, it gives the design team which may include now uh, in the future, not only the structural engineer and the architect, but perhaps climate scientists as well, and perhaps you know, other people from, from social sciences, it gives them more flexibility to address the true needs of the stakeholders without, uh, without uh, sacrificing uh, performance or safety. It presumes that safe uncertainties can be modeled, and it presumes that risk can be managed at an acceptable level. Uh, and we'll come back and we'll talk about that a little bit. So the selection of performance goals and the measurement of performance through a system analysis, quanti quantification of reliability targets, and communicating resist risk to the client uh, are all part of an essential part of performance-based engineering. For those of you who are structural engineers or architects in the audience, and of course I have no way, way of knowing, I'll, I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to what changes that might mean uh, in the routine practice of your profession. What is risk? Uh, risk uh, in, in the broadest sense uh, involves probability uh, of occurrence, uh, which is system or hazard uh, described by probabilities or, uh, or uh, hazard curves, response, um, uh, which must take into account the fact that building structures, uh, you know, despite the advances in structural uh, mechanics, uh, uh, one can't predict them perfectly. Uh, they, one does pretty well, but one can't predict them perfectly. That involves consequences, uh, which I refer to as simply death dollars and downtime. And then it refers to who the decision maker. And that is a way of saying, uh, is, is, is it an individual or is, 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 it, is it a a government agency? Is it a private corporation? Uh, who is it? Because everybody has different risk tolerances, uh, and uh, that needs to be taken into account uh, in the design process. I don't know if, if, if uh, you are uh, in the audience are familiar with Frank Stockton's story about the, the lady and the tiger, uh, but this is a, a good example of, 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 of probability and consequences. I couldn't find a tiger, so I had to use a lion, but the idea is basically the same here, uh, that you know, consequences can be relatively mild, uh, and uh, that requires you know, moderate safety levels, or consequences can be extraordinarily severe, which require very, very large uh, safety levels. You know, that little uh, uh, slide that I showed you previously uh, uh, where the, the ICC performance levels represents a first step at trying to handle this. Uh, we also have uh, a similar uh, requirement in our ASCE 7 load standard. Uh, but uh, in an era of climate change, uh, where things are changing all the time, you know, those target reliabilities need to be, re need to be uh, reevaluated. So uh, in probabilistic risk analysis, uh, which is a, a traditional way of doing things, it's been widely used in the last four decades to stipulate a de de site-dependent demand intensity for design for insurance underwriting. For performance evaluation, I should have on the line for, for, for individual facilities because it, that's where it applies. It applies to individual facilities. It does not capture the spatial variation and demand uh, for, from a, a, an event uh, with a large uh, geographic footprint. And I will point out to you, if you remember the different hazards we're concerning, so concerned with, that many of the uh, natural hazards that are impacted by climate change uh, uh, do have large geographic footprints. Uh, and that means, you know, that they, uh, one needs to consider how they might affect a community. Uh, a scenario analysis uh, doesn't ca capture uh, that spatial variation. Uh, it's easy to communicate the threat of the hazard, particularly if your scenarios can be, uh, can, can, can be likened to previous events. But a range of scenarios must be considered to convey risk you know, to a spectrum of, of events. So uh, you know, how we deal with climate change and how we deal with stipulating design basis events 
uh, in a changing climate uh, is something uh, that you know, our, our, our professional societies and, and, and the climate community who, who are the expert in, in, in climate effects are gonna, have to, are gonna have to deal with. The last thing I'd like to talk about uh, a little bit is, is community resilience, because it's something that, that uh, has, has, has become uh, to the, raised to the national attention over the past uh, 10 or so years uh, through uh, a number of different initiatives by various federal agencies, including the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, and, and the National Science Foundation. Community resilience, uh, it depends on the performance of the built environment considered, of a, considered as a system, as well as those social, economic, and public institutions that, that make a community livable. Uh, many climate-related natural hazards have large geographic footprints and are likely to affect communities as opposed to individual, as well as individual facilities. Uh, and so uh, a resilience-based approach, uh, thinking in the long term, is probably something that, that will enable our climate-related solutions in the built environment to, to take on a, a much richer array of, of, of alternatives uh, when uh, designers try to achieve uh, 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 climate goals and at the same time uh, 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 an, economic, an economic solution to their problem. What is community resilience? Well, it, this, is a, this is a National Academy uh, presidential policy directive definition. It's the ability of a community to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and to withstand and recover from disruptions. It emphasizes both mitigating damage and implementing measures to ensure that, <clears throat> that there's a recovery to, to near normal functionality in a reasonable point of time. And the little cartoon on the right shows that all of these factors that go into uh, community resilience, again, are, are uncertain, characterized by uncertainty and, and randomness needs to be taken into account. Uh, to move forward from our current prescriptive, um, uh, uh, the status quo involving prescriptive codes and standards, uh, emergency uh, response planning uh, and reliance on federal disaster recovery. Uh, to move forward, we need to have community based performance goals uh, and, and a comprehensive performance based approach for the built environment. Uh, and, and so this is going to require an evolution in, in, in architecture and in structural design practice and in urban planning. And it's not going to occur, it's not going to occur in, 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 within a five year code cycle or even a 10 year code cycle, but it's, 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 a, it's a statement of aspiration. It's something that we should, we should work toward achieving. Uh, some of those community resilience goals deal with population stability, economic stability, social services stability, physical services, and governance stability. And I've just given some examples there of, of, of some of the some, some of the resilience metrics uh, uh, conforming to those resilience goals that have come out of recent research in the NIST-sponsored Center of Excellence for Community Resilience uh, Planning. Uh, so these are the types of things that people are going to have to look at. They're going to have to view these goals and metrics through a social science lens. Uh, and I took this paper, I took this figure from a paper by Steve French and a couple of his students, which appeared about 12 years ago. But it, 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 it bears, it, it bears a, a very, very thoughtful examination in the way that we come up with design requirements for uh, the built environment, for civil infrastructure systems, uh, that uh, these civil infrastructure systems indeed uh, serve the purpose of providing uh, for community well-being and a healthy uh, and a useful and a prosperous community. And in order to achieve those goals, one needs to take a broader view uh, than, than simply just viewing it on the basis of limit state probabilities, which is what we do right now. Uh, they're necessary, obviously, but may not be sufficient. And how to implement through regulation, acquisition, uh, taxation, uh, expenditures. Codes and standards are just one part of that, by the way. Uh, and so communities need to look at these and every community is distinct and every community will have its own solution and that's okay. Uh, but it means that there may very well be a fundamental change necessary in the building regulatory process rather than to rely on national codes and standards. So. Uh, parting thoughts, uh, it's climate change will accelerate the impact of, of natural hazards. Um, uh, it requires a new way of thinking uh, for resilience-based design, I think. 
uh, community resilience goals that address the future uh, impacts of climate change should be identified by uh, a broadly based stakeholder group. And, and performance objectives, last of all, you know, performance objectives articulated for the built environment must be expressed in terms that are compatible with engineering and re regulatory processes wherever possible to, to, to get support from the various communities uh, who will have to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's very important you know, to recognize that there, there are going to be some trade-offs that occur and, and you know, picking the trade-offs and, and, and how to deal with them uh, is something that is, is very important. So I, I wanted to I wanted to mention this. And this is a little bit a one off, uh, but we hear a lot of talk about uh, climate change in in the popular literature, and the, and the public is, to me, it seems is 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 somewhat polarized over over how to deal with climate change. You know, they they you know, the, the 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 climate community uh, uh, is is very forceful in advocating uh, that we're near tipping points. Uh, if we don't do something, uh, a, a large part of, of, of the population and many of our, our, our politicians have the opposite view. And, and there are some fundamental principles uh, in communicating risk uh, to the public and buying support to, to, to new approaches. And here, here I put on my, my risk analysis hat uh, and, and say the first, thing, uh, the first thing to do is don't scare the daylights out of people. You know, you know be clear. Uh, as to the objectives, uh, use simple language. Uh, try to engage the audience by ad adapting the message to the local community. Uh, be, a, be state who is at risk. Give options. Uh, embrace uncertainty, and, and last and most important, uh, build trust. And I think those are important. Uh, those are all important things uh, in communicating uh, the importance of adaptation to climate change. You know, to 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 the engineering community, uh, to the pop to the public as well, so that they are they are willing to support these initiatives uh, that are necessary in order to mitigate these effects over a long term period of time. So my conclusions, uh, very very briefly, I think design codes will have to be updated, but I I feel that 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 you know we don't need fundamental changes to the building regulatory process at least initially. Uh, climate change involvement of, from, from the scientists is going to have to be, is very, very important. Uh, and I think that, that code development uh, can be aligned uh, with the general trends toward performance-based engineering and consideration of community resilience. And in fact, I think we're, I think we're missing the boat uh, if we don't use this opportunity uh, to push those other new initiatives forward at the same time, because I think they're mutually reinforcing. Here's a few uh, references for, for th further reading. Three on the left are from ASCE. Uh, the one on the right is, is a very interesting reference, which came out of a, of a climate-related activity in, in Canada to incorporate climate effects in the National Building Code of Canada. Uh, and, and these are all available. Uh, and, and for those of you who are interested in, in reading more about this, I encourage you to pick them up. These are some of my collaborators uh, that I've worked with. I've already mentioned uh, uh, Professor Bahini. Uh, you can see it's, a, it's an international group. People from Italy, Brazil, Canada uh, are all involved with it. Uh, and uh, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did had it not been for the involvement of these people. And I personally am very grateful uh, to all of them. And I'd like to close this on a personal note. Um, uh, I live in, in, in a small community in the front range of the Rocky Mountains called Estes Park. Uh, and in 2013, uh, we had uh, an enormous flood, uh, which was due to about 18 inches of steady precipitation. Uh, uh, the, the best estimates of the climate people in, 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 in Boulder at, at NOAA estimated it was about a thousand year flood. Uh, and, and this is what it did to the road that leads up to my house. Uh, and we had to evacuate. And we were out of our house for about three weeks before they could restore uh, public transportation. We didn't suffer any damage to our home, uh, but we couldn't get in and out. Uh, and so if we, th this, this to me you know, made climate effects highly personal. Uh, uh, and, and I think you can, you can probably understand. Uh, and so uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that you will take all of this personally as well. And in the meantime, I very much enjoyed 
uh, the opportunity to, to talk to you uh, about this compelling national problem. So thank you one and all. Thank you, Boaz. If, if Professor Casagrande is on the call, and I don't know if he is, I want to thank him for extending the initial invitation, and I'd be delighted to take questions uh, if there are any. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. That was so exciting. And I, I hope that the road is uh, fixed by now and you can oh, it, uh, it get is. back home. <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is fixed. It took, it, took about, it took about six months before things got back to normal. Wow. But, wow. Uh, it's, uh... Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to kick off the, the question piece uh, just to ask, you know, I, I really... Uh, it was really interesting to kind of think how to project uh, some some of the scenarios. And as you know, you know, uh, buildings do change or change their function as those crises happened. And quite often, for example, libraries had to serve the population as hospitals or as like you know a place where uh, the community goes to to seek shelter. Uh, and, and, you know, so what do you do kind of, I, I think I'm with you on the scenario design kind of idea and kind of thinking about, you know, projecting business modeling uh, around those things when uh, buildings particularly, I guess, will be changing their function or, uh, you know, like as, as in response to, you know, like whatever is going on. Uh, and is there something that can be done kind of thinking, you know, let's say the libraries, you know, need to kind of project a future for the next 15 years. Uh, and, you know, like, uh, and, and, you know, like, is there, is there something that we need to kind of think of uh, and uh, apply as we're thinking that those uh, risks are going to be uh, not as predictable uh, going to happen quite often and in terms of our own community. So kind of, uh, you know, like what, what can we do? That, that's a very, very good question. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the short answer uh, is, is that the building codes, at least, uh, that govern uh, design practices, the prescriptive building codes, do not require uh, the engineer to, uh, to, or the architect to consider the possibility of, of a change uh, in, in the occupancy of the building uh, during during its service life, and instead, the way that that typically is handled is that if 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 a if a if a building is <clears throat> is 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 uh, sold and then is going to be used for something else, they have to have a structural engineer come in and they have to evaluate the building uh, uh, and, and determine whether or not, in fact, it's it's safe for its proposed occupancy before uh, be, before it's granted an occupancy permit. Now, th this is for the general building um, uh, inventory. If the building is owned by, by a university, for example, uh, and, and you know, this is one of the advantages actually of the performance-based approach, uh, because if, if the university architect uh, is given the, the task by, by the board of trustees to design a, a new library or a new um, a gymnasium or something like that, and, and, and if the uh, if if he says at the time, well, you, you know, you know, we have a capital campaign running, and we don't know what we're going to get, but maybe in ten years, if it's successful, we might want to do something else with it. Then that can be taken into account in the design of the building. Uh, it, it's it's more difficult to do that when you're when you're designing a building for the commercial market because uh, the, the developer typically doesn't have any idea what the building's going to be used for 50 years from now or even 30 years from now. And many commercial buildings change hands about every five to 10 years in the marketplace. And so it's very, very difficult you know, to, 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 to plan on that. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question, Boz, because, because it, it points out one of the advantages of, of a performance state based approach over a, uh, over a prescriptive approach. Uh, I, I, I'm aware of the fact that, that during COVID, uh, and, and, and this is, this is related, you'll see where I'm going with this. There were some, you know, there, there were places, you know, where COVID hit particularly hard, uh, and, and, and they didn't have room for all of the sick people uh, in, in the hospitals. And so they had to convert other facilities into temporary, um, in, into temporary um, uh, healthcare facilities. Uh, and you know, th that's, that's, that's a question that, that's, that's related to, to, to the one that you ask. What do you do uh, if, you, if you have to uh, if you have to convert a facility to something else, it, it may not mean uh, necessarily that you have to change the building structure, but you probably are going to have to change all of its utilities. It's, it's heating, it's ventilating, 
uh, its water supply, uh, uh, gas supply, whatever is, is used to heat and cool the building, you're going to have to you're going to have to uh, recognize that that those requirements for for the HVAC system are going to be completely dependent upon the occupancy. And if you change the if you change the projected use of the building, all of that's going to have to change. Uh, and uh, so it, it's a very difficult question to, uh, to deal with. Uh, thank you, Bruce. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start uh, reading the questions as they came in. Uh, William uh, Black uh, is asking, uh, could you comment on the recent structural failures uh, due to Ian and Nicole on Florida's coast and the potential for more large structure failures due to uh, shoreline erosion events? Um, if you're referring to the Surfside condo collapse. Um, uh, the investigation of that is 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 still underway. Uh, I'm not involved with it, uh, and I think it would be premature uh, for me to comment on, on on what might have might have happened there because uh, uh, actually NIST is uh, is managing that investigation, uh, and uh, is the best to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's uh, uh, it's 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 still underway. Uh, I think that uh, as as far as, as as coastal construction in in in, in general, uh, if 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 I can generalize the response to uh, to, to the question, I, I think that um, I I, th I think that that uh, it's it's a matter of economics right now because there really aren't any specific guide guidelines uh, that a, an engineer. Could could take to apply uh, to to a, a, a building in 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 coastal Miami or in 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 Fort Myers or someplace like that uh, above and beyond the um, uh, above and beyond what's currently in the building code uh, with, without possibly incurring some sort of liability and so that's that's one of the reasons I think why it's important uh, to uh, to to at least get some pre preliminary. Um, justifiable criteria for climate resistant design and construction in the building codes uh, as, as quickly as as we reasonably can, because I think that, you know, people will say, you know, some people might say, you know, 20 years from now, well, you should have known, you know, that the current, or that the current uh, tropical cyclone um, requirements weren't enough, or you should have known that, you know, that the sea level rise was going to be higher than, than, than we thought it was going to be. And, and so we need to you know, we need to, to do something fairly quickly. ASCE has an initiative underway, you know, to try to uh, uh, incorporate some climate effects in the 28th edition of, of, of the national, of the, of the American, of, of, of the standard, uh, ASCE 7 standard. And ASCE um, ha has recently um, uh, embarked on a collaborative uh, pro program with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to come up with um, uh, come up with with the necessary science and the data necessary to at least start introducing um, uh, climate resistant construction into our building codes. But you know that's that's going to take a while to do that. You know, uh, our building process has to go through a uh, through a, um, a consensus process in order in, in order to get put in the code. And in the meantime, uh, the the engineer is 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 kind of up to his own. You know, up to his own um, you know, resources uh, in order to do that. Yeah, I don't know I, if that answered the question or not, but I think so. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the, you mentioned COVID and uh, its impact, and uh, you know, on libraries and and kind of the data uh, uh, systems we're using. There was a lot of sharing that happened, you know, uh, quickly because we, you know, the whole, you know, humanity needed to know as soon as possible what's going on, and and libraries definitely were partaking uh, in making those things happen as soon as we could. Uh, as well as collaboration with uh, our providers and our infrastructure folks kind of trying to expedite as much information as possible across different domains. Uh, and and uh, related to kind of something like that, Paolo Buccini is asking, uh, as this project approaches its completion, uh, could we imagine of using it as a template for other fields uh, beyond structural engineering? Uh, for example, how to reimagine zoning processes, how to plan large infrastructure systems. Uh, would it make sense to study the main successes 
uh, biggest challenges arisen and lessons learned to share them with other professional communities? Yes, <laughs> a short answer. Uh, I think one of the things that, that, that uh, we should do or, or we should consider doing uh, is a, a lot of my focus uh, in my presentation here today focused on individual facilities. Uh, and, 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 and that's why uh, that, that, that's why uh, um, I, I, uh, I talked about you know wind pressures on buildings and things of that nature. But it's also why I induced or introduced the idea of performance-based engineering and why I introduced the idea of community resilience. Because to do the, the types of, of uh, of projects that Professor Bahini is is uh, suggesting uh, requires, I think, uh, something akin to the approach that we currently take for uh, uh, resilience or resilience-based design and construction. Uh, and so, if you remember that last slide that I, or one of the last slides I presented, you know, the, uh, where you 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 treat the community as a system, uh, and, and and you try to design things uh, so that everything works together, uh, which of course requires a commitment on the part of the community planner uh, in order to design something like that. But I, I, I frankly, I, I, don't see, I, I don't see how it's possible to do that uh, it, it, with a focus that remains on individual building construction. But of course, that's what the current codes focus on. So to answer my own question, I'll say that in order for you know, this vision to become a reality, I think uh, that the, 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 the building codes themselves will have to admit, you know, the wisdom of, of designing at least portfolios of buildings, if not the entire community, you know, using some overall um, uh, coordinated set of goals and objectives. But I, th I, th I think that, you know, I think that, that I think we've learned a lot from this uh, and, and from, from this, this project. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that, I think that, that this is, uh, transferable. I think it's transferable to community planners and community developers. I, I think the thought process that goes into it, particularly from a performance-based engineering point of view, and if you view community resilience through that social lens that uh, Professor French suggested, uh, I, I, th I think that uh, I think that it's possible to do this. I do. Thank you, and and sorry, uh, Professor Bachini, I not Buccini. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, going to uh, in in uncertainties in general, uh, Aditya Sharma is asking, uh, you know, how will we deal with those uncertainties, uh, and uh, is there other models that can take them into account, uh, and uh, how will these uncertainties? Uh, propagated to risk uh, resilience parameters. So basically, are they? Uh, can we calculate <laughs> that new algorithm uh, well enough uh, to go beyond, you know, the prediction? I guess uh, of those coming years. And uh, how do we how do we go about continuing to utilize data uh, in a way that will uh, make sense? Okay, uh, I, I think that's a I think that's a great question, uh, and and uh, uh, I, I think that that um, uh, that in the short term, uh, I think that that the you know the uncertainties are 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 you know, you know are are, are, some, are are somewhat manageable. I mean, we have a task within the special project to look at how to, how to model these uncertainties. Uh, what happens or what will happen, I think, uh, is is that if, as we project. Uh, these trends out further and further, uh, I think uh, that, that the uncertainties get very, very large, uh, and, 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 and particularly the, the contribution of the, the knowledge-based or what we call the epistemic uncertainty sort of overshadows uh, the, uh, the, the, the local fluctuations, which are, are, are normally due to the normal weather fluctuations you have from year to year. So uh, if, if you look at if, if you look at those un, 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 uncertainties, you know they become you know, very 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 you know very very large, uh, and and, and uh, it, it, the problem isn't so much in in calculating the risk associated with them. The cal the, the problem is is, in so, is associated with interpreting, you know, the risks that are calculated. I mean, if you if 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 your if your uncertainty if your probabilities or if your uncertainties you know, you know, cause your your estimated risk or your expected life life cycle cost you you know to 
you know, to vary over two or three orders of magnitude. You know, it's not particularly useful for engineering decision profit. Uh, making purposes, um, you know, they, you know, in the nuclear industry where I do, you know, some consulting work, um, uh, years and years ago, they used to propagate the epistemic uncertainties uh, in in, uh, in in the in the risk, and they found out that the probability of a core damage event, you know, was you know spanned around three orders of magnitude. Well, from a, from a regulatory point of view, there, there, that's that's a, a, a essentially a, a useless number because you know there's no way of of using classical statistical tools to determine whether or not you're within or without the confidence interval. So, you know, they changed their way of doing that. Now they now they they calculate a maximum, you know, a probable event you know, by combining all uncertainties together and getting a point estimate rather than, you know, trying to, you know, deal with, with the epistemic uncertainties explicitly. So I think that I, I think that the, the tools are are are, are there for, for dealing you know, with those uncertainties, provided that the scenarios are are, are analyzed carefully, and, and 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 that's one of the things that that I I worry about a little bit uh, as to whether or not uh, whether or not these scenarios uh, are are really uh, are are really sufficient for engineering decision making purposes or not. I, I, it's all we have to work with, uh, but but I I, I know that uh, from my and from other quarters, I know that uh, if, if, if the scenario assessment or if the scenario identification is not complete, uh, the, risk, the risk estimate you know, may, may not be worth very much for, for decision-making purposes. Now, on the other side, I think that, that we have very, very good people you know, working on this. And I think that you know, in the next five or 10 years, I think you know, there's very likely to be you, you know, a, a, a great increase in, in, in knowledge as to how to deal with them. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, uh, it's one of the things that I think is is, is a barrier uh, for uh, uh, for implementing this into building codes. Thank you. Um, there is a, a question about uh, new structures. Uh, so uh, you know, this what what you're describing seems to uh, work well for a, a new initiative, new structure, kind of assessing risk uh, and, and, and investment. And then uh, what is it that we can do, if anything, about the old structures that are already there? Uh, and the person is asking, uh, says, uh, I don't think that replacing them is the solution. So uh, what no, can I, I, uh, my, my, my friend, Dan Frangipal, a colleague and friend, Dan, Dan Frangipal, actually, he, he's co-chairing an activity within the special project that deals uh, with those types of problems. So I'll give you my personal opinion uh, with, 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 the, with the caveat that, that you know, he, he might say something different <laughs> if given the opportunity. But I think that you know, one of the problems, uh, you know, I, 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 first of all, I agree with the sentiment that you can't just go replacing um, new, new structures uh, or, or old structures, you know, they're, they're you know, it, it would be, uh, it would be impossible from a, from a public or private investment point of view, you know, uh, aside from, from, from that many, many older structures have historic value uh, and, 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 you know, there would be tremendous resistance to having having them replaced just because some climate scientist or some structural engineer like me you know said that they're not safe enough you know I think that um, uh, you know, I, I think you know designing new structures and rehabilitating existing ones uh, is a somewhat different engineering process uh, and in fact you know there are you know there are structural engineering firms and there are architects that specialize in one versus the other uh, because there are enough differences between the two where you know it's hard to find it's hard to find somebody with a skill set to handle uh, both uh, situations uh, i mean the, the the principles of science and, and and structural engineering still apply of course uh, but one of the issues uh, you know, it would be to deal with uh, the effects of any deterioration that might have occurred uh, as a result of temperature effects or, or, or you know, you know, moisture or things of that nature. So the, I, I think one of the first things uh, to, to, to th that would that I would be concerned about is whether or not uh, uh, the, the the climate effects that may have occurred over a period of you know 200 years or 100 years ha have have created changes to the structure where, whereby uh, I, I no longer have the ability to analyze it accurately. And, and that would be a concern. Uh, I think that uh, procedures like you know, non-destructive evaluation you know, you, you know, can help 
uh, de de determine that. And, and if if the state of, of the existing structure is uh, is 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 known, uh, then you know the same principles of engineering, of course, apply. Uh, but uh, when you're designing or when you're evaluating an existing structure, there's always the question of of what the remaining service life is going to be. And so when you're designing a new structure under climate change, uh, the service life considerations are going to be different than they are from, from evaluating or rehabilitating an existing structure because of this problem of stationarity that I talked about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a question about the uh, modular housing. Uh, Cynthia McManus uh, is asking, if there is a deliberate attempt to look at the stock of modular housing uh, and you know the impacts on people living in modular housing uh, will tend to be at the lower end of the economic spectrum uh, seem to be disproportionately high uh, and uh, what what can be done particularly to a community that may be facing uh, very high risk um, <clears throat> uh, modular construction, I assume that you're basically referred to pre-engineered or, or mobile homes or something other than something along those lines. Uh, we, we don't have any, in, in, any plans specifically to, you know, or at least at the present time to, uh, to, to, uh, uh look at, uh, their, their performance. Uh, I, I agree, uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, there, there may be a, there may be a problem there. Uh, that needs to be, you know, there, there's a manufactured housing institute uh, that has its own set of design standards. Uh, I believe, I don't work in this area, but I believe that their, their wind provisions are very similar to those in ASCE 7. Uh, but I, in, in this particular case, I, I think that, uh, I, I think one of the things I, I would be concerned about, one of the things that people who, who I've worked with talk about is, is, is whether or not um, you know, uh, whether, whether or not um, uh, risk uh, to vulnerable populations are better handled by, you know, by, by enhanced design requirements of, of the residential construction, or if they're better handled, you know, by, by, by changing uh, the zoning and, and, and the you know, land use requirements to keep them out of areas uh, uh, where uh, they're, they're put at additional risk uh, as a result of, uh, of climate change, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of of coastal areas or areas along rivers, places like that. You know that that you know that, that uh, some of the most effective ways of, of of dealing with climate effects in in the short term is 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 to keep people out of those areas where they're likely to be put at risk. Uh, and it, it turns out that, that uh, you know those areas sometimes you know see large numbers of vulnerable populations. That that was true down in in in, in New Orleans in particular after Hurricane Katrina in the Lower Ninth Ward. You know those were very very poor you know, people, very vulnerable, and uh, uh, and and um, uh, a very difficult social problem uh, to deal with that because you know, most of them didn't have the the, the money uh, or the resources to. To, to protect themselves from that sort of thing. Uh, so, but we're not doing any, we're not doing any work uh, in, in, in that area right now. Thank you. Um, this is a quite a uh, specific question. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, it, it, this, it is about the difference or the dynamic uh, between a sea level rise, so the SLR, which is a continuing process. Uh, and uh, according to the uh, person is asking, the magnitude of SLR is a function of time uh, and uh, a typical design life of 50 years. Uh, and hurricanes last only hours, uh, but the number of hurricanes frequencies related to the design life. So there are two uncertainties kind of happening at the same time. Uh, and, um, and and when you're thinking about the design life, so 50 years versus 20 years, uh, how do you kind of get into something that is legible when you're trying to compare those two uh, different uh, type of processes, uh, a continuing one and an abrupt one, when you're thinking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a... That, that, that's a fair question. You know, they're 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 they are treated as 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 
independent hazards, but they, they really are not. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, the hazards are, are probably strongly coupled and as sea level rise continues over the, over the next 80 years, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the impact of hurricane storm surge on coastal communities is, is, is going to increase you know, um, um, commensurately, um, perhaps in a nonlinear fashion, uh, because you know, as the hurricanes move ashore, you know, you know the, the 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 wind uh, is 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 going to drive, uh, and the low pressure is going to drive uh, the the the, uh, the the surge. Uh, but if if the, if the if the sea level rise has already gone up by half a meter, that surge is going to be even worse, uh, and so uh, uh, that, that they need to be treated. As 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 really as as coupled hazards, uh, and 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 right now they're not. Uh, you know when we when you look at at the building code, you look at ASCE seven. Uh, sea level rise primarily is 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 treated at least at the present time through through limitations on land use, uh, whereas uh, whereas uh, um, uh, storm surge and 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 coastal flooding and and hurricane tropical cyclone wind pressures. Are, are actually covered in the in in, in ASC seven in the building code. Uh, what they need to be, to be uh, they need to be treated together. Uh, they need to be coupled together, uh, and uh, we don't do that right now. Mm -hmm. I'm so tempted to ask if libraries can do something about it, but uh, <laughs> You're, I'm sorry, say that, say that again. I, I, I'm tempted to ask if we can share information, use the library as a resource to kind of you know share data, and is that sufficient? Because uh, quite often, you know, like the the data need the storyteller. The storyteller need to uh, uh, speak in terms that the other uh, audience understands, and uh, that's always a, a question. And you know, uh, the previous series we had was about uh, uh, disinformation, and misinformation, and and trying to kind of uh, situate. The, the 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 problems we're getting we have uh, culturally and say you know like something about using uh, the libraries as a resource uh, the data the collections that we're providing as a resource but obviously that's not enough you need the experts to tell the story and kind of uh, speak in a manner that uh, that uh, you're doing today uh, you know uh, speak to the public and and explain uh, what are the complications uh, around that. Um, so, um, Bruce, we have time probably for one more question, um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and, and the question is, uh, again, uh, somewhat personal, uh, but it relates to what you were describing. So, uh, Peter uh, Weissmantel, I think, uh, is asking, uh, when the road to your house was repaired, uh, was anything done differently uh, to take into account the increased hazard in order to mitigate another event. So were you able to actually assist, you know, the, the work uh, or uh, some of the ideas that you shared with us today, uh, were they useful, you think, to prevent another uh, road collapse that you, uh, that you faced uh, in your community, in your house? And if not, <laughs> how, do we, how do we do it better? Well, uh, the, the short answer is no. I mean, the, the, the Colorado Department of Transportation came back with, came out with a, uh, with a lot of fill and, and, and asphalt, and they, they rebuilt the foundation and they put it back to, they put it back to, to where it was before, and we now have a nice four-inch um, asphalt slab uh, that we drive on. Uh, but they didn't do anything to, uh, uh, to they didn't do anything to, to uh, enhance the capability or, or the enhance the resistance uh, of, of, of the road. Uh, nothing. Uh, it, interestingly, um, and this is typical um, uh, of, of many communities. You know, you, uh, you know, uh, as part of that activity, though, it turns out that uh, you know that the floodplains were, were not located correctly in, in, in Estes Park because the construction had, had 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 taken place since the last time the last time that that uh, that the National Flood Insurance people had a look at where the floodplains were was 1976, and so there were a lot, there were a lot of properties along that road that were that were heavily damaged as a result of the flood because they were they were in the floodplain, but they didn't think they were, uh, and, and as a result uh, they weren't able to get the subsidized insurance. Uh, but uh, one one of our problems, I think, uh, is 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 keeping up with 
um, you know, the, the latest in terms of, of, of hazard threats. Uh, and uh, I don't think in some cases we don't do a very good job of that. But no, they answer your question. You know, they just put, they, 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 they didn't build back better. They just, uh, they just build it back. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope that soon enough, there's going to be a pointer at least for us to say, hey, look at that study and the project that Bruce is involved with. <laughs> so, you know, you take some notes from, uh, you know, lessons learned uh, throughout the project so we can yeah. uh, go back to our, uh, you know, municipality and say, please follow that code. The, 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 Boaz, the plan is, is to publish the results of this study sometime um, uh, late in the first quarter or early in the second quarter of next year. Uh, so there will be a report mm -hmm. uh, that explains how we, we got to the conclusions that we reached, uh, which will be a resource uh, document for, for, for other people who are interested in, in, in what our take was on, 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 on this problem and, and what might be done to address it. So it will be available. It's going to be, a, it'll be an ASCE publication of some sort. I'm not sure if it'll be a manual or a special publication or what it'll be, but they'll advertise it, I'm sure, because they want to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Maybe maybe then you come and join us again and talk about your findings. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, it was, it was uh, really interesting and good luck with your project and all the Lehigh folks that are involved in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't, don't forget the next uh, sessions. Uh, one coming in December uh, around the postage uh, exhibit and uh, the two more coming uh, events uh, around climate change. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, and uh, thanks, everybody. And have a good evening and uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.